here we back with another interesting video now today's video is going to be a follow-up to when i dropped the other day entitled take a look up on the screen why did the haitian military overthrow king henry christoph classic video one of my best videos and today we're going to talk about what happened after the death of king henry christoph right after the death and i got some interesting comments as well take a look up on the screen this brother said man what absolutely pisses me off is this story is such prime material for a Hollywood blockbuster or miniseries. A man born a slave rises up through the Haitian Revolution, educates himself, gains respect, amasses power and wealth, becomes a king, builds one of the most iconic structures in the world, and in the end, his own hubris and mortal body ends up failing him in public when he needed it the most, and his empire ends with him shooting himself in the head as his enemies descended upon his palace. Prime material for movie making, but Hollywood is not interested in black history unless it's a slave movie where the white people are also the good guys. And that's a fact, man. There really isn't any there really isn't any white savior in this storyline. I mean, I guess you could say Thomas Clarkson and William Wilberforce. I guess you can place them in the storyline as one of the good white guys, but even they had to take somewhat of a subordinate position to Christoph's authority. So yeah, there really isn't any white savior. In fact, all throughout Christoph's life, He's outsmarting the whites. He's defeating the whites in battle. He's defeating the whites in political negotiations. He's defeating the whites in diplomacy. He's defeating the whites in an economic battle. He's defeating the whites in naval encounters. He's defeating the whites in military encounters. He's defeating the whites in pretty much all facets of life. The whites were defeated by Christophe. You know, the American whites, the French whites, the British whites, the Spanish whites. They all got defeated by Christophe. So there really isn't any, there really isn't any, any place you can really force the whites, the white savior into the storyline. So yeah, if there's going to be a movie made on Christoph's life, black men got to put up the money. Black men got to put up the movie studio. Black men got to write the script. Black men got to do the casting. Black men got to, you know, grab our nuts and, and do it by ourselves, bro. Black men got to tell our own stories, period, point blank. Now today, let's talk about what happened after the death of Christoph. For those of y'all who watched the last video, you know it ended tragically, bro. It ended tragically, man. Christoph in the palace, you know what I'm saying? He grabbed the damn pistol, shot himself, bro. You know what I'm saying? He said, I'm gone. Y'all not about to take me. You know what I mean? If I can't live like a king, if I can't live like a boss, you remember, what was the slogan of the Haitian Revolutionary Army? It was freedom or death. Either we are going to live how we want to live or we are going to die. And Christoph, he stayed true to that motto. He stayed true to that slogan. If I can't live like a king, if I can't live like a boss, if I can't wake up every damn morning and go to my balcony and take a sip of some whiskey, take a sip of some liquor, smoke my cigar on the goddamn balcony of the palace, if I can't live like I want to live, then I'm going to kill myself. I'm going to die. See, Christoph went out like a G, man. He went out like a G. He went out on his own terms, man. He said, fuck y'all. Now, let's continue. Let's get into it, man. Let's talk about, let's go a little deeper. As you already know, for those of y'all who watched the video, Yes, during that time when Christoph was in power, the country was split into two governments. The Kingdom of Haiti in the north, that was Christoph's territory, and the Republic of Haiti in the south, that was controlled by the light-skinned mulatto officers. Now, we're going to jump back into the book. As I told you, take a look up on the screen. Henry Christoph and Thomas Clarkson, a correspondence. Yeah, we're going to jump into it. We're going to jump into some official government letters, official government documents. We're going to jump into the book, man, you know, and we're going to talk about Christoph's administration and also what happened after the death of Christoph. Man, it's going to be very interesting. Let's jump into it. Take a look up on the screen. For those of y'all who already watched the last video, you already know Thomas Clarkson, English abolitionist, high, high ranking member of the English elite, the British elite. He was one of Christoph's closest friends, you know, one of the few white men, you know, one of the very few white men who was allowed into Christoph's inner circle, Thomas Clarkson. You know, we're going to jump into some, some letters written by Clarkson, written to Clarkson. It's going to be very interesting, man. So let's get into it, man. Take a look up on the screen. Henry Christoph was a leading general of the Haitian Revolution. After the assassination of Emperor Dessalines in 1806, Christoph assumed the line of military succession would propel him to office. Unfortunately for Haiti, the racial prejudice of the wealthy descendants of the French, aka the light-skinned mulatto plantation babies, who were the sons of the Frenchmen and the African slave women, yes, you know, listen, that's what they meant by the by the wealthy descendants of the French. Yes, the, the plantation babies with white fathers. Now let's continue. Unfortunately for Haiti, the racial prejudice of the wealthy descendants of the French refused a government led by a formerly enslaved black man. They attempted to include Christophe in a Republican government that would effectively reduce his post to one without any significant decision making powers. Christophe refused to accept and engaged in a civil war against them and their leader, General Alexander Pichon. There was no conclusive winner. 
as a solution, they divided the nation into two sovereign territories, Kristoff's kingdom in the north and Petro's republic in the south. Now, as you already know, Kristoff's kingdom, lavish, beautiful, stable, prosperous, rich, schools being built, theaters being built, palaces being built, everything being built, the citadel being built, forts being built, the military is strong, everything is amazing in the south. The Republic of the South, controlled by the light-skinned plantation babies, it was poor, it was corrupt, it was bullshit, it was unstable, everybody was fucking, it was full of crime, it was full of bullshit, them boys did not know how to run a country, you know, the plantation babies did not know how to run a country, you know, and the Republic of Haiti, it still exists today, and as you can see, the Republic of Haiti is an extension of the, of the Southern Republic that was created by the plantation babies way back then, now let's continue. Take a look up on the screen. This is a letter. This is a letter that was written by Christoph himself and it was sent to Thomas Clarkson. Take a look up on the screen. Let's read it together. Christoph said, starting with the top, the affliction of our civil war, knowing from experience that our domestic quarrels would serve only to comfort our enemies. I remained on the defensive and trusted that time would calm passions and cool heads. I repeatedly took the initiative and tried to bring General Pichon back to a proper sense of duty, which he owed to himself as well as to his country. Though my attempts to restore peace represented a sacrifice of my pride, I felt that the good of my country and the happiness of my compatriots made such action necessary. Such was my conduct, and I can say with satisfaction that my advances toward a reconciliation were made with all the frankness and sincerity which are natural to my character. What was the result? Each time, an absolute refusal on his part to unite with me for the defense of our endangered country. New insults, new threats, and outrages in answer to the most just and honorable proposals which I could offer him. Now, as you can see, Christoph on multiple occasions tried to extend the olive branch over to the plantation babies, but they didn't want to hear it. You know, it was all that European blood flowing through their goddamn flowing through their goddamn bloodstream. They didn't want to hear it. The plantation babies did not want to unite with the black man. You know, in typical plantation baby fashion, they were riding with their white fathers. You know, it is what it is, man. Now let's continue. Christoph went on to say, General Pichon has embarked in a cause not of his own, and his efforts to mislead the Haitians under his command will prove fruitless. They are no more disposed to resume the yoke of slavery than are the inhabitants of the north, east, or western parts of the kingdom. It is a consolation to see that the great majority of Haitians have reached an understanding and that a common danger has tacitly united us all from one end of the island to the other, for we all abhor the French and their oppressive government. General Pichon, by refusing to make common cause with me, by keeping up a correspondence with the enemies of the state, by accepting bribes from them, and by the asylum and protection of which he gives the French ex-colonists, has excited just suspicions in the minds of even that part of our people which he had led astray. He is closely watched, and the ruin of his cause is not far distant. The reports I receive from his part of the island are highly satisfactory. The arrival of any new French forces would only hasten the complete reunion of all the Haitians. I agree perfectly, dear sir, with all the arguments which you have brought before me. Every one, perhaps of your just reflections and thoughts, had occurred to me before. But what more can I do? My conscience is easy, despite the lies and calumnious reports continually circulated by General Petron and his agents concerning my character and my government, I appeal to God and to mankind as witness to the justness of my intentions and actions. I leave it to my friends, my fellow citizens, my contemporaries, and to history to decide between the general and myself. And Christoph, let me tell you, big bro, let me tell you, history has decided. History has decided, bro. History has decided. And yeah, we already know who's the superior one. We already know who's the king. We already know who's the real one. You know what I'm saying? And we already know who's them traitors. All right. Listen, you heard what Christoph said in the letter. Christoph said that General Alexander Pichon continues to maintain communication with the enemies of the state. Who are the enemies of the state? The French, the French king, the French, the French government, the French cabinet, the French king. That was the enemies of the state. And Christoph said in the letter that General Alexander Pichon has continuously maintain communication with the french crown and not only that general alexander pichon he was the one did you know we're gonna talk about this later in the video too the, f the fact that haiti paid reparations to french slaveholders and what people don't really know is this haiti was not forced to pay reparations to french slaveholders if that was the case why were they forced what over 20 years after independence because they paid in 1825 so why didn't they pay in 1808 1811, 1813, 1814, 1816, 1818, 1819. How come they did not pay? When Christoph was alive, how come they didn't force Christoph to pay? Why not? Why is that? I told you, when the French sent an ambassador to Christoph's territory in 1814, Christoph had the ambassador in prison 
and murdered. When the French sent an ambassador to General Pichon's territory in 1814, General Alexander Pichon, he invited him to the presidential palace. They had drinks, they had dinner, and he agreed to pay. He agreed to pay, and Christophe had the ambassador killed. So listen, there was no force. There was no force. The fact of the matter is this. When Christophe died, and General Boyer, another plantation baby, another mulatto plantation baby, when he came to power, he decided, he willingly decided, he willingly chose to pay his father, his grandfather, his cousins, his white French family members reparations because, like I told you, he was a plantation baby. He was half French. He was 50% French. He was a half Frenchman. He was raised in France in the Napoleonic army. General Jean-Pierre Boyer, who came after Christophe and reunited the, the country back together, he was basically a Frenchman, okay? He was a Frenchman. He was very friendly to the French kingdom. He did not fire a single shot towards the French, unlike Christophe, who had Frenchmen murdered and scared to come to his territory. So no, Haiti was not forced to pay. Haiti willingly paid because a mulatto plantation baby was in power and he paid his family members. And they revised the history and made it seem like the French was this big and bad military force that forced the Haitians to pay at gunpoint. No, nigga, no. Your damn, your mulatto plantation baby willingly paid you the money. That's what it was. And when Christophe was in power, you were too scared to show up. Now let's continue. Take a look up on the screen. In 1818, General Petron died of yellow fever. His successor, General Jean-Pierre Boyer, reunited Haiti two years later when Christophe had a stroke and committed suicide. Now, if you haven't watched the video I dropped the other day entitled, Why Did the Haitian Military Overthrow King Henry Christophe? Go watch that video, man. Go watch that video. That is part one. This is part two of this video. You gotta watch part one, man. Now, if you watch part one, then you already know Christophe, he shot himself in the goddamn chest. He shot himself in the heart as the military was descending upon his palace, you know, it is what it is. But also, it was two other major figures that died, right? Christophe's 16-year-old son, as you can see, take a look up on the screen. His son, Prince Jacques Victor Henri Christophe, he also was killed by the military, right? He was killed. He was arrested. He was killed by the military because they wanted to destroy the monarchy. And it was a hereditary monarchy, which meant that if Christophe died, then his son would be next in line, right? Either his mother would be the regent and he would be, you know, the king when he would reach a certain age. Now, they killed the son because they wanted to um, destroy the line of succession. And also, they killed one of Christophe's right-hand mans, one of the most loyal supporters. Even when the military turned against Christophe, his, one of his right-hand mans, Baron de Vasti, Baron de Vaté, he stayed loyal, man. He stayed loyal. He didn't switch. Even after Christophe died, he remained loyal to the kingdom. He remained loyal to the kingdom when everybody else switched. And Baron de Vaté, he also was murdered during the rebellion against Christophe, right? He was murdered, I think, the same exact day that Christophe's son was murdered. Baron de Vaté, he was murdered as well, right? Baron de Vaté, young, young brother, man. Young brother. And listen, he stayed true. He stayed true to the very end. One of the realists. Salute to Baron de Vaté. And in fact, I got a letter written by Baron de Vaté. Baron de Vasti, whatever you want to say it. Baron de Vasti, Baron de Vaté, whatever you want to say. I have a letter written from him to Thomas Clarkson. And before we get into that, take a look up on the screen. Let's read about who the hell was Baron de Vaté. Pompe Valentin Vaté, also known as Pompe Valentin or Baron de Vaté, was a Haitian writer, educator, and politician. Vaté was what people called at the time a mulatto because he was born to a white French father and a black Haitian mother. He served as secretary to King Henry Christophe and tutor to Christophe's son, Victor Henri. Vaté also claimed to have fought in Toussaint's army and is said to have been the second cousin of the French novelist and playwright Alexander Dumas. Vaté is best known for his essays on the history and contemporary circumstances of Haiti. Now let's jump into the letter written by Baron de Vaté. Take a look up on the screen. He said this, It was with deep regret that I learned from your letter that your health has been seriously affected by your arduous labors in behalf of the abolition of the slave trade. But heaven is just and will surely prolong your life until you have seen your work crowned with the fullest degree of success. Your desire to come and spend the rest of your days in Haiti flatters us immensely. It proves unmistakably your high opinion of us. We indeed hope that someday we may have the joy of seeing you and we do not feel that our hope is necessarily an idle one. Before closing, I must also tell you a little bit about my own family. A heart such as yours will not be indifferent to a friendly interchange of confidences. I was born at Henri, a parish in the interior of the country around 1781, which means that I am now 39 years of age, or almost so. At the age of 15, 
I entered into the service of my country under the command of General Toussaint of glorious memory. Later, I served under Emperor Dessalines and the present King, Christoph, my August Sovereign. I've been married for 12 years. I have two daughters, Malvina and Arisi, and I'm enjoying all the happiness possible in the bosom of my family. I am, sir, with the most sincere friendship and the feeling of the greatest veneration, your very and humble obedient servant, Devasti. Now, salute, rest in peace, bound de vate. Real one, real G, real boss. You know what I'm saying? Now let's continue. Now I'm gonna jump into one of Boundevasti's essays, one of the essays that he wrote. We're gonna read a paragraph written from one of his essays where he described Christoph's personality. Where he described Christoph, you know, his close friend, you know, his right hand man, Christoph. Let, let's see what let's see what Boundevasti wrote about King Henry Christoph. Let's get into it. Take a look up on the screen. Henry Christoph, from the earliest dawn of his public and private life, has uniformly shown himself frank upright and honorable an excellent father a rigorous disciplinarian strict in the discharge of his own duties active brave and generous lively in his disposition incapable of fraud or dissimulation he always speaks and acts with manly candor just to the virtuous and severe to the guilty he is prompt to reward the one and punish the other he carried with him to the throne all his virtues public and private his frankness his integrity and his justice his inflexible character and principles have often been prejudicial to his interests and his enemies have uniformly endeavored to turn his very virtues against him now like i said when everybody else had turned against Christoph, when everybody turned their back bound Vasti was one of the very few to remain solid remain solid bruh he was like bruh y'all kill Christoph, y'all gonna have to kill me too bruh y'all gonna have to kill me too fuck that you know what i'm saying so he stayed loyal, man. He stayed loyal to the very end. Now, let's continue. Let's jump back into the book. From the time of his assumption of authority, Christoph not only maintained a large standing army, but attempted to transform his soldiers, accustomed to predatory warfare, into an orderly fighting force. The morale of an army, he insisted, lay in the respect of the men for their leaders and in their pride in themselves. And he knew that the scrupulous observance of military regulations provided the key to the efficient coordination of his troops. Thus, he imposed the harshest discipline on his men. They were drilled constantly, carried out difficult maneuvers, and were frequently required to participate in formal reviews. On the parade ground, the most meticulous attention to details of dress, posture, and formality was required. The uniforms of the officers were extravagantly colorful. Christoph took pleasure in reviewing his troops, and his giant stature, his manly and dignified bearing, and his powerful personality led impressiveness to the scene. Christoph employed the year 1815 in feverish activity. He not only greatly increased the size of his army, but placed on a military footing all of the population capable of bearing arms. He made ready his inland fortresses, particularly the Citadel Henry, and assembled guns and ammunition. Petron too prepared for an assault. So great was the fear of France that relations between the rival governments seemed to have become more friendly. Now, it goes back to what I said earlier. The French Empire, the French king, had to wait for Christophe to die, had to wait for Dessalines to die, have to wait for all the black generals to die, and wait for the plantation babies to finally take power, and that is when the French were finally comfortable enough to open negotiations fully to get reparations paid to the French slaveholders. Because when Christophe was on the throne, you had to go through Christophe to get that reparations, and Christophe already made up in his mind, listen, we are either going to live free as free black men and women or we gonna die nigga and if we gonna die we gonna take a bunch of frenchmen with us so that was the mentality so the french had no way of securing reparations with christophe still alive bro and that's why that's why reparations was not secured until over 20 years after independence long after christophe died long after Dessalines died because they did not build the citadel for no reason they built the citadel for the french that's what they built the citadel for they bought all them cannons for the french that's why they bought all them cannons for they bought them guns for the french they bought that ammunition for the french to stuff that ammunition inside their body so listen listen the french had to wait damn near over two decades for Christoph to die that is when they finally were able to open negotiations fully when the plantation babies were in power and control the entire island now listen that's the facts because when y'all tried to when y'all tried to approach Christoph with them same negotiations he killed y'all motherfuckers bro he had your ambassador killed he had the French ambassador killed in 1814, Franco de Medina, and the French never took any retaliatory measures against Christoph, bro. They never took any retaliatory measures. How the hell your ambassador get killed and you ain't even put out a statement? You ain't put out no, you ain't do nothing? You let your ambassador get killed in Haiti and you ain't do shit? Oh my God, bro. That's how you know the niggas was shook of Christoph, bro. Had you shook, bro. Let's continue. The Citadel was never used for military purposes, and Christoph did not live to bring it to completion. An earthquake has caused an ugly rent. 
Now moss and foliage line and rich orchard and mimosa blossoms soften the ravages of time. Even in ruins, however, it rivals the Egyptian pyramids and offers a testimony to its creator. Age may crumble its walls, but the citadel born of suffering and hope is a living symbol of the magnificent dream of Henry Christophe. Now the reason why the citadel was never used for military purposes was because the French didn't want that smoke when Christophe was alive. And the plantation babies were too bitch made to fire a single shot when their daddies and their uncles and their grandfathers came to demand reparations. You know, if they were real men, if they were real men and not plantation babies, they would have goddamn grabbed the cannon, grabbed the gun and nigga, let's go to war. But considering they were plantation babies who were half French, yeah, you are bitches. Now let's continue. Now this part of the book is a letter written from Thomas Clarkson that was written to Christoph. Now Thomas Clarkson, as I already told you, British abolitionist, one of Christoph's close friends, you know, one of Christoph's homies. He was actually, he went to France on behalf of Christoph. Christoph sent him 6,000 pounds and sent him on a political mission to go negotiate on behalf of Haiti in France. As I told y'all, if you convert 6,000 pounds to the money of today, to USDs of today, that's over 600,000, almost $700,000. So Christoph said, my nigga, hold that. Hold that 600,000, bruh, and go to France. And go, you know what I'm saying? Go, go politic on my behalf, bruh. You know what I'm saying? That is how that is how politics works, black men. Politics is more than just voting. Politics is, nigga, put your money where your mouth is, bruh. Where your money at, bruh? That's politics right there, bruh. Where your stacks at? Not, not no little bit of money. Not no $5, $20, $100. No, nigga. Where's your $600,000 to go lobby in Europe? To go lobby. That is what it's about, bruh. That's what it's about. Where's your hundreds of thousands of dollars? Where your millions of dollars to go lobby? That's what it's about. Now let's continue. Thomas Clarkson, he wrote to Christoph and he said this. It is a fact that a great number of the ex-colonists are reduced to beggary and they depend upon pensions from the French government for their support. These men are constantly troubling it for money and urging it to acts of hostility against Haiti for the recovery of what they have lost. This is one reason why the French government hesitates to acknowledge your independence. For if it were to make this acknowledgement, then it would have the burden of supporting them and their families forever. By agreeing, therefore, to an identification, you would thus remove a constant source of discord between you and the French government. Yes, brothers, you heard that right. The French colonists who were driven out of Haiti and sent back to France, they were up in France living on welfare, bro. They were on welfare. Them niggas was begging. Them niggas were reduced to beggars on the street. My nigga just, bruh. The French government had to motherfucking subsidize these motherfuckers because they was going broke. You know what I'm saying? They was going broke. They had no income. Nigga, they were beggars. They were begging. They were reduced to beggary. You know what I'm saying? So that's why the, when the plantation babies came to power and they agreed to pay, we ended up becoming reduced to beggary. Thanks to the plantation babies who agreed to pay that debt. You know, like I said, I'm going to call them. I'm not going to call them mulattoes because I feel like, you know, that's kind of, I don't know. I'm not going to call them mulattoes. I'm going to call them what they truly were. Plantation babies, all right? Plantation babies, that's what you were, fucking plantation baby. Now, let's continue. Now, take a look up on the screen. Christoph issued a declaration on November 20th, 1816, asserting that he would not negotiate with France on any other footing than that of power with power, sovereign with sovereign, and that the preliminary basis of negotiation must be a recognition of the independence of Haiti, not only the kingdom, but Petro's domain as well. Christoph insisted that no definitive treaty shall be concluded with his government without having previously obtained the good offices and mediation of a great maritime power, which will guarantee the faith of the treaty from ever being broken by the French. Neither the French flag nor individuals of that nation shall be admitted within any of the ports of the kingdom until the independence of Haiti has been definitively recognized. Now, that is how you negotiate when you are a real man, when you are a real black man and not a plantation baby. You know what I'm saying? When you are a real black man and not the son of a white man, when you are a real black man, that is how you, that's how you negotiate with the colonial powers. You see, when it came down to the plantation babies in the South, they didn't react like that. They didn't react like that. They reacted with open arms. Let's have drinks. Let's have dinner. Let's negotiate. You know, let's let, let's negotiate plantation daddy. Let's negotiate. But Christoph was like, nigga, come to my territory, nigga. I'm whacking you niggas, bro. Step foot over here, nigga. You done. Now, let's continue. Take a look up on the screen. This positive statement put an end to all further attempts of the French government to gain supremacy over Christophe. Now, like I told you, they had to wait for Christophe to die for them to finally come to an agreement to get reparations to the French slaveholders, bruh. Because when Christophe was alive, they did not want that smoke. They did not want that smoke. And for those of y'all who watched the last video, Thomas Clarkson actually wrote a letter to Christophe saying that he was greatly disturbed 
over the size of Kristoff's standing army, right? Thomas Clarkson was like, bro, like, God damn, nigga. I mean, Jesus Christ, you got all these men standing at arms? Shit, nigga. You, you more strapped up than us back in England. God damn, bro. You know what I'm saying? Kristoff was not playing with you bitch-ass niggas. Now, let's continue. Take a look up on the screen. Let's start at the top. Clarkson had become a goodwill ambassador for Kristoff, and the latter, ever quick to estimate the character of others, determined to use his English friend in an official capacity. Clarkson, he knew, was a man of the highest integrity and one well versed in European politics and intimately acquainted with many of the leaders in England and France. Christophe had long realized that his own position was precarious and that his aspirations for the Haitians could not be achieved until Haiti was recognized as an independent nation. Such recognition must come first, however, from France. Yet where was he to begin? He had indignantly driven off the French agents who came in 1814. Like I told you, he killed them. He murdered them. He didn't drive them off indignantly. T tell it like it is. Christophe murdered the French agents. He killed them. Homicide. Let's continue. He driven off the French agents who came in 1814 and again in 1816 and in the early months of 1819 in reply to repeated French overtures made through General de Vincent for a commercial treaty, he boldly asserted that the preliminary basis must be a recognition of Haitian independence. Nigga, that's what you call standing like a man, nigga, standing like a real man and not like a damn plantation baby, nigga. Yeah. Now, let's continue. He determined, nevertheless, to take the initiative, and on November 20th, 1819, he appointed Clarkson as his delegate to France. He accompanied the appointment with a letter of instructions and dispatched 6,000 pounds to cover the expenses of the mission. Like I told you, 6,000 pounds back in the day converted to the present day, over $600,000, bro. You know what I'm saying? Christoph just handing out just nigga stacks to niggas like, bro, nigga, hold that. Hold that 600,000. Hold that 400,000. Hold that, hold that 800,000. Hold that 1.1 million. Nigga, told you, Christoph's the most powerful black man of the last five centuries, nigga. The most wealthy black man of the last five centuries. Throwing out stacks like it ain't shit. And let's continue. In acknowledging the independence of Haiti, France was not to expect more than a share of Haitian commerce. The treaty was to contain no provision for any indemnification of the former colonists. You see, when Christophe was alive, his negotiations to the French was, listen, if we negotiate for you to recognize Haitian independence, number one, you're not gonna you're not gonna control our commerce, number one. You know, we're gonna we're gonna sell products to who we wanna sell products to, we're gonna get money with who we wanna get money with, we're gonna ally with whoever we wanna ally with, and you're only gonna get a share, right? As a trading partner, that's it. And we're not gonna pay you no indemnification payment. We're not gonna pay you jack shit. That's what that was that was Christoph's negotiation. You see, the plantation babies in the South, in the Southern Republic, they were the one willing to not only offer France exclusive share of commerce, but also an indemnification as well. Now let's continue. Take a look up on the screen. Let's jump to page 69. At the time of General Petron's death in 1818, Christophe had urged by means of a proclamation to the Haitians of the Southern Republic and a letter to their generals and magistrates that the country should unite with the kingdom, an offer which they rejected. In 1820, however, Sir Home Riggs Puffam of the Jamaica station, that was a British general, all right, Sir Home Riggs Puffam, big British chief, you know what I'm saying? That was one of Christoph's right hand mans, you know, one of Christoph's homies that would come to the palace and be kicking it at the palace, Sir Home Riggs Puffam. Look him up. Sir Home Riggs Puffam of the Jamaica station undertook the good offices of mediator between the rival governments. So Christoph told Sir Home Riggs Puffam, yo, go talk to the plant, go talk to the plantation babies down in the south, you know what I'm saying? Because they probably gonna respect you because you're a white man. I'm a black man, they, they don't respect me, you know what I'm saying? So go talk to the plantation babies and tell them what it is, you know what I'm saying? So Her Sir Home Riggs Puffam was like, yo, Christoph, I got you. I'm gonna go down, I'm gonna go down south, I'm gonna talk to the plantation babies. Don't, don't worry about nothing, big bro, I got you, you know what I'm saying? I got you, you know what I'm saying? Sir Home Riggs Puffam, big British general, nigga, yeah, let's continue. Sir Homerick's Puffam of the Jamaica station undertook the good offices of mediator between the rival governments, probably at the instigation of Christophe. He first went to Port-au-Prince to confer with President Bayer, Petron's successor, whom he found quite willing to arrange a pact with the king for their mutual defense. He then communicated Bayer's proposal to Christophe. Finally, on the eve of his departure for England in the early summer of 1820, he wrote to Bayer, advising him that the treaty ought to have for its principal objects the establishment of concord between the subjects of the two states and an agreement to unite their forces in case of a French attack, and warn him, don't plan ever to make war. Don't try to advance beyond your frontiers, because if you do, I shall consider you as the aggressor, and you will be held responsible in the eyes of the whole world. Now, let's talk about that, bro. Let's talk about that. When Christoph sent Sir Homerick's Puffam down south to go negotiate with the plantation babies, he basically told him, listen, 
Sir Homerick's Puff Fan went to President Baye and said this. Listen, it would be in your best interest. You know, whatever you and Christoph go got going on, that's none of my business, right? Listen, that that's family business, whatever. But it would be in your best interest if you would unite your forces, at least militarily, with Christophe for your mutual defense against the French. We never know when the French might pull up. So it would be in your best interest to work side by side with Christophe to defend your national territory. And he also told him at the end, as you can see, don't plan ever to make war. Don't advance beyond your frontiers. Meaning that, nigga, if you step an inch over the border into Christophe's territory, just know we got Christophe's back. Just know, Christoph, he not alone. You know what I'm saying? You alone. You a little plantation baby standing by yourself. You ain't got no one standing behind you. Christoph, not only he got the money and power, not only is his government more solid, nigga, he got the British Navy, the British Army, nigga, the British Crown standing next to him, bro. So if you step out of line, nigga, I promise you, I promise you, I swear on the British Crown, nigga, we are going to wipe you off the face of the planet, bro. So you better stay in your little corner down south and you better respect Christoph's territory, nigga, or nigga, it's not going to be Christoph you're going to be fighting against. You're going to be fighting against Christoph and the entire British military, bro. I swear to God. I swear to God, nigga, it's Sir Homerick's Puff Fam, nigga. I put that on the British crown, nigga. Christoph, that's my dog, nigga. Christoph, that's my guy, nigga. So you disrespect, nigga, I'm knocking your fucking head off your neck. That's what Sir Homerick's Puff Fam basically told President Baye and the rest of the plantation babies down south. Let's continue. Take a look up on the screen. He assured Boye that Christoph was sincerely disposed to enter into an agreement of the most perfect amity and that the delegates whom Boye apparently intended to send into the north would be guaranteed absolute security. Unfortunately, no formal treaty materialized before Christoph died in October 1820, but it is significant that he should have made a complete about face between the years 1818 and 1820 and abandoned all ambition to unite Haiti under his authority. Haitian foreign policy, however, is the most important and constant subject of discussion in the correspondence. In his first letters, Christoph emphasizes the necessity of guaranteeing the safety of the Haitians before turning to their moral and cultural improvement. He begs his friend to continue to impart to me those observations which your experience with the policy of the European cabinets may suggest to you, and implores him to give me the timely notice of any machinations which our enemies may devise against us. The collaboration between the two men offers a remarkable example of mutual understanding and good faith. They're talking about um, Christoph and Thomas Clarkson. Now let's continue. Now, take a look up on the screen. This is a letter written from Christoph himself. Christoph himself wrote this letter and he wrote it to Thomas Clarkson. Now, take a look up on the screen. Let's read it together. You ask me, my friend, if any communication exists between myself and General Boye. The situation is this. Upon receiving word of Pichon's death, I made overtures to Boye in an attempt to bring about a reconciliation. I pointed out to him that justice, reason, and the best interests of the Haitian people all demanded our union and the formation of a single government. My efforts were unavailing because ambition and the baser passions speak more loudly in the corrupt breasts than the desire for the well-being of the nation. At least... I have the consolation of having done once more all that was in my power to reunite my country. You must have seen in the proclamations dated from St. Mark the offers which I made to Waye. But I must tell you, my friend, that in Port-au-Prince, there exists a group of troublemakers from all parts of the world who always make every effort to mislead public opinion. These men take the greatest pains to intercept any writings which might inform the people concerning their own best interests. Man, now what Christoph said about Port-au-Prince... Man, they still say the same shit about Puerto Prince still to this day. That's where all the corrupt motherfuckers be at in government. That's what that's the capital of the corruption, bro. I'm telling you, bro. The capital of the corruption. Where all the corrupt politicians be at. Christoph was saying that shit 200 years ago. We still say that shit in the modern day. Let's continue. We have heard that the French were trying to come to terms with Boye. What I tell y'all, bro. President Boye, fucking plantation baby. Of course the French want to come to terms with him. You a goddamn son of a Frenchman, nigga. You came out the ball sack of a Frenchman. Let's continue. And there can be no doubt that they are still trying to carry on intrigues with him as they did with Pechon. I myself believe, as you do, that Boye might well lead astray the unfortunate Haitians of that part of the island. And Christophe was right, because after Christophe died and Boye came to power to rule over the entire island, he decided to pay reparations to French slaveholders. So Christophe was correct. Boye did end up leading astray the unfortunate Haitians. And let's continue. He is the pupil and emulator of General Pechon. And is following in the latter's footsteps. If you add to the fact that the presence of a great number of Frenchmen of both colors have taken refuge in Port-au-Prince. You see, President Boye 
The plantation babies down south were already letting Frenchmen come back to the island. They were already letting Frenchmen resettle on the island because they were plantation babies and they were the sons of Frenchmen, right? The sons of Frenchmen and black women. That's what happens. That's what happens, right? When you're the son of a white man, yo, when you're the son of a white man, I cannot be I cannot be surprised at anything that happened. Any action taken by the son of a white man when the temperature gets too hot. I know you're gonna side with your I know you're gonna side with your European side of the family. I'm already knowing. Now let's continue. You may be able to judge the influence of the French party and to understand how constantly I must be on my guard against what could happen there. I beg of you that, for your part, you will pass on to me any information which reaches your ear. I promise you that I shall take no step which might frighten Boyer and induce him to throw himself into the arms of the French. If he does anything of that sort, it will be on his own accord, since he is well informed of my intentions towards him. Now, let's continue. I believe this is another letter written by Christophe to Thomas Clarkson, I believe so. Now let's continue. Christophe said this in this letter. The French colonists would assuredly use every means within their power, not only to perpetuate slavery in the Spanish part of the island, but also to sow the germs of dissension and revolts in Haiti, and by their intrigues to rob us of the peace which we at present enjoy. We are profiting by our precious moment of tranquility to devote ourselves to the tasks which are the object of all our desires, education and agriculture, which alone can make our people numerous and happy. What conduct should we observe under such trying circumstances? Shall we allow our most cruel enemies to establish themselves at our very gates under the specious excuse of Spanish protection? And if this captain general should give asylum and overt protection to our enemies, could he complain if we in turn should harbor and aid the Spanish revolutionists? And yet, we have taken no such steps, but we reserve the right to do so, if necessary. I believe in that letter, Christoph was talking about how the Dominicans of that time were, you know, offering protection and land to some French ex-colonists. And Christoph was like, would I be wrong if I go, you know, to, to the Dominican side, to the Spanish side, and start letting that chopper sink? You know what I'm saying? Start letting that chopper dance on them niggas? <laughs> Let's continue. Take a look up on the screen. This is a letter written by Duncan Stewart. That was a, I believe that was a British physician. That was actually the physician that actually diagnosed Christoph when he had a stroke and told him that his right side of his body was paralyzed. Duncan Stewart wrote to Thomas Clarkson and he said this from Cap Henry, December 4th, 1819. Dear sir, I hope you will excuse the liberty I take in addressing you. The welfare of the people of Haiti, I have much at heart and will always feel the greatest gratification in communicating to their friends in Europe any information that may be useful in enabling them to form a just estimate of the state of the country and how they may best advise the king and prosecute the Haitian cause. I know that many of those who wish to befriend this country have formed from inaccurate and contradictory information very erroneous notions of the state of Haiti and they suppose these people have much lower in the scale of civilization and intelligence than they actually are. I speak of this side of the island. Talking about the kingdom. He's not talking about the he's not talking about the Southern Republic that was controlled by the plantation babies. Them niggas can't run the government. Them niggas corrupt. Them niggas incompetent. Them niggas didn't know shit. He said, I speak of this side of the island, ran by the black men. You know what I'm saying? Let's continue. He went on to say, Perhaps there never was a man who, from the energy and acuteness of his mind, and from an intimate knowledge of the character of the people he governs, was so well calculated to rule a kingdom as the present king of Haiti. He found the Haitians at the death of Dessalines in the most complete state of anarchy, and the soldiery abandoned to every species of licentiousness. His intelligent mind soon discovered that he had but one course to follow, and at the sacrifice of his natural disposition, he was forced to employ severities for which he has been unjustly reprobated by those who are ignorant of their necessity. The good effect of this policy was soon evident. Great enemies become daily less frequent and are now unknown in the kingdom of Haiti. In proportion as his people can bear it, their liberties are gradually increased, and although many of the disadvantages of a perfect military government still necessarily remain, the power of the chiefs over their inferiors is diminishing daily. The hospitals of the kingdoms I have wholly under my care, and the king has given me complete power to order what I think necessary for the diets, clothing, and accommodation of the sick in his hospitals. I can safely say there is not a hospital in England where the sick are better supplied with all the conveniences and necessaries than the hospitals in Haiti. At my recommendation, the king has likewise much increased the rations of his troops, and they are well clothed. Every soldier receives per day 22 ounces of bread, or a sufficient equivalent of some nutritious vegetable. Besides, they have half a pound of fresh beef made into soup, and by a late decree, each soldier has a certain quality of land given to him, on which he is permitted to spend four months every year, and where his family have a comfortable home. With these advantages, the soldier does not require any pay in money. The agriculturists are allowed one-fourth of the produce of the land. 
besides the privilege of the use of some land to raise fowls, hogs, and vegetables for their families and for the markets. Their fourth of the produce is regularly calculated when it comes into market by officers appointed for that purpose and most punctually paid. The king himself is most particular in paying those on his own estates and always attends in person on those occasions to see it done and to receive any complaints or petitions which his agriculturalists may have to prefer. There is a king's lieutenant stationed over each district whose duty it is to receive and transmit to the king any complaints which the agriculturalists may have to make. And the proprietor, if he cannot satisfy the king as to his conduct, is sent to a prison until the agriculturalist demand is paid. If any proprietor uses his labor ill, on complaint being made and found to be just, the laborer is sent to one of the king's estates where all the laborers are well used and are as comfortable and happy as any peasantry I ever saw in any part of Europe. Now listen, that's what the white man said about the kingdom of Haiti, okay? That's what the white man said about Christoph's, you know, capacity as a goddamn leader, as a goddamn governor, as a goddamn king, okay? Listen, the white man was like, listen. The white man was like, listen, you know we hate blacks, but goddamn, King Henry Christoph, he's that guy, you know, you know what I'm saying? He's that guy, I gotta admit, he's that guy. You know, he's really that guy, you know, he's, he's really him. He's really him. <laughs> let's continue. Now, let's jump to the part of the book where they talk about after Christoph's death, right? Take a look up on the screen. On this page, they describe the aftermath after Christoph was overthrown from power. Take a look up on the screen. At the top, it said this. Almost at once, Thomas Clarkson was bombarded with appeals for money from the funds Christophe had entrusted to him for his French mission. Boyer, though he had made off with the treasury of the dead king, fucking thief, plantation baby, absolutely refused to pay any of Christophe's obligations. So the plantation babies stole Christophe's money and didn't even pay anybody. Didn't pay any of Christophe's obligations. If you watched the last video, you already know all the, all the schools were closed. Everything stopped at his death. Yo, they didn't pay nothing. They didn't maintain nothing. Goddamn plantation babies. Let's continue. Wilson, Stewart, Sanders, and even an English business house presented their claims, and Clarkson set about evaluating them with his usual thoroughness. The sudden transformation of Christoph's kingdom from its high level of law and order to one of confusion and turbulence filled Clarkson with foreboding and alarm, and he was especially concerned over the unhappy plight of Madame Christophe and her two daughters, who are now at Port-au-Prince under the protection of President Boyer. He noted, too, with the greatest uneasiness, the ominous upsurge of French interest in Haiti as manifested by the French journals, I told you, once Christophe was out the way, the French, they seen an opening. Once the plantation babies took power, the French was like, yup, we back, we back. You know, when I be like, when I open my YouTube videos, I be like, we back. Listen, the French was like, we back. Because the plantation babies, they were in power. They controlled the whole island now. Let's continue. His letter of inquiry to Dupuy remained unanswered. He wrote directly to President Boyer on May 25th. 1821, warning him of the duplicity of the French and indicating the solicitude of many people in England for Christophe's widow and his children. His letter was obviously designed to open a correspondence similar to that conducted with Christophe. Boyer's response was really a rebuff and rather bluntly maintained that the Haitians could take care of themselves. Only we can guarantee our rights. Clarkson's concern over the fate of Madame Christophe, however, seems to have suggested to her the advisability of going to England. Boyer wrote that the Christophs wished to spend time in England for the sake of their health and that he had given them permission to leave. As you seem to take great interest in their welfare, I have no doubt you will do what you can to be of service to them. So yes, Madame Christophe and her daughters, they relocated to uh, they relocated to England. And shout out to uh, shout out to Thomas Clarkson. You know, listen, listen, listen. Listen, even though when Christophe was overthrown, they killed his son, they killed Bounded Vasti, they killed his right hand man. But listen, we're not gonna harm we're not gonna harm our beautiful Haitian women, bruh. We're not gonna harm our beautiful Haitian women, bruh. Listen, we fought and died for those women. We're not gonna harm them. Christophe's wife was not harmed. She was able to live in, live in the country after Christophe's death for months and months after Christophe died. She had her own mansion. She was living comfortably under the protection of President Boye. Listen, we're not we're not gonna touch the ladies, man. You know, we we're not gonna touch the ladies. You know, the ladies they off limits, bro. You know what I'm saying? They off limits. You know. But Thomas Clarkson was worried about their safety. So yeah, Christoph's wife and his daughters ended up coming to England under the protection of the British Navy, under escort of the British Navy. You know what I'm saying? So yeah, you know, Christoph. And as I told you before, Christoph left behind over 70 million dollars for his wife and his kids so when they relocated to europe they already had more than enough resources to maintain themselves for the rest of their life you know madame christoph she she lived until very old age she outlived all her daughters and she lived a comfortable life never had to work a day in her life lived wealthy all over europe all over italy all over england living like a real queen now let's continue take a look up on the screen 
The death of Kristoff and the overthrow of the kingdom were matters of bitter regret to Thomas Clarkson. Not only were the brilliant projects of the former king laid in ruins, but Clarkson and other friends of the Africans in England had lost in the wreck of Kristoff's well-organized government the opportunity to prove to the world what a free and independent Negro state could accomplish. The letters Kristoff received from Haiti were most depressing. They gave a graphic account of Kristoff's illness, the insurrections, the death of the king, and the final destruction of the monarchy and show how every beneficial aspect of the royal regime, the improvement of agriculture, the development of education, and the prosperity of the nation rapidly disappeared. Especially significant are the attempts to evaluate the character of Christoph. Every writer bears testimony to his greatness. Both Wilson, the English teacher whom Clarkson had sent to Haiti, and Stuart, the king physician, agreed that Christoph had become undisciplined and cruel, and the revolution was the inevitable result of his tyranny. Sanders, on the contrary, praised Christoph and maintained that his downfall was due wholly to the machinations of his enemies. All the correspondents concurred in their low opinion of Waye's administration. Now listen, there were a lot of mixed reactions to Christoph's death, but one thing they agreed upon was, listen, fuck Waye. Listen, they were like, listen, regardless of what Christoph might have did towards the end of his reign, listen, fuck Waye. This plantation baby cannot run the country. This nigga is a fucking failure. Now let's continue. Let's jump into the administration of General Jean-Pierre Boyer. As you already know, he came to power after Christophe died. He marched into Christophe's territory 20,000 strong, and then he incorporated Christophe's territory into the Republic of Haiti. You know, it is what it is. Let's get into it. Take a look up on the screen. Let's jump back real quick to 1814 because we're going to talk about the, the debt that was paid, the reparations that was paid to French slaveholders. Take a look up on the screen. In 1814, the president of the Southern Haitian Republic, General Alexander Pichon, suggested to the French government that Haiti pay an indemnity to the former plantation owners whose property had been seized by the Haitian government when the country declared independence in 1804. The goal was to undermine the plantation owners lobbying in France for a military expedition to retake control of the lost French colony. The French were uninterested at first, but they adopted the idea later on when they decided to recognize the country's independence. So yes, as you can see, General Alexander Pichon, who was the the, how do I say it? He was like the, the mentor to General Jean-Pierre Boyer. He was the one who was who first agreed to pay the debt to France. But he died in 1818 and Jean-Pierre Boyer came to power. And then once Jean-Pierre Boyer was in power later on in 1825, he was the one who finalized the deal between the French and agreed to pay reparations to former French slaveholders. The debt that Christophe never paid. The debt that Dessaline never paid. But them plantation babies, they paid it. And for that, it's fuck them forever. Fuck Baye. Fuck Petron. Let's continue. Take a look up on the screen. Haiti was able to pay the first installment of the indemnity in 1825 by issuing bonds which were traded on the Paris exchange. The first debt was the reparations owed to the plantation owners, while the second debt was the money owed to the Haitian government's bondholders. Beginning in 1826, Haiti was unable to pay both debts, angering French authorities who threatened the young republic with military action. In 1838, a new treaty lowered the reparations to 90 million francs. Haiti did pay the entire sum, erasing both debts in 1883. Now, I hate when people say that the Haitians agreed to pay. Y'all gotta, y'all gotta make the correct statement. The plantation babies, the sons of the French colonists agreed to pay, okay? The sons of Africa did not agree to pay, okay? The sons of the plantation babies agreed to pay, okay? The sons of the white men agreed to pay. And unfortunately, because, you know, the plantation babies are part of our nationality, unfortunately. Um, yeah, so it says the Haitians were agreed to pay. The Haitians did not agree to pay, man. Listen, we were under the rulership of the plantation babies. And it is what it is, man. The plantation babies agreed to pay the plantation daddies. Now, let's continue. Take a look up on the screen. Now, let's talk about the regime of Jean-Pierre Boyer. First, as part of Haiti's image as a haven for people of African descent, Boye, in cooperation with African Americans and abolitionists from the United States, supported an immigration campaign for a free people of color. The first wave of migrants arrived in the mid-1820s. Although many faced hardships with adjusting to a new climate and a cultural and linguistic environment, some remained and started a new life in Haiti. They would be later joined by a second wave of migrants in the 1850s and the 1860s. Now, let's talk about how the Republic of Haiti, the Southern Mulatto Plantation Babies from the Southern Republic, ended up controlling a tiny, tiny portion of the south of the southwest part of the island of Hispaniola. And how did they end up controlling the entire island from the west side to the east side, to the, from, the, from the French side to the Spanish-speaking side? How did the Plantation Babies from the south 
end up getting so much power that they ended up controlling the entire island of Hispaniola from the west to the east. Let's talk about it. Take a look up on the screen. In the early 19th century, the east side of Hispaniola found itself influenced by the revolutionary currents and movements of independence sweeping throughout the rest of Latin America. The political dissent in Spanish Santo Domingo was exacerbated by a series of economic hardships, incompetent administrations, high inflation, heavy taxation, and social disorder during the period that has come to be known as the España Boba. By this point, the colony had been neglected by the crown and the lack of money and instability meant that the colony could not function regularly with the military force that was not being paid on a timely basis. At the same time, a threat of the forthcoming invasion on the part of the French was feared by the Haitian government on the other side of the island. For Haitian President Jean-Pierre Boyer, the unification of Hispaniola became an important objective. He believed that unifying both sides of the island would facilitate defense against an eventual French attack. This proposal from Waye became one that was contemplated by many. On the other hand, Jose Nunez de Caceres, Lieutenant Governor of Santo Domingo, represented the dissatisfied military leaders in the capital. Their goal was to proclaim the independence of Santo Domingo and to become part of Simon Bolivar's Grand Colombia. The people of Santo Domingo found themselves at a peculiar crossroad, one that offered them three possibilities, unification with Haiti, annexation to Grand Colombia, or to remain as a Spanish colony. Unification with Haiti gained support among the slaves and the non-white Dominican masses as it was believed that it would lead to the abolition of slavery and greater equality for all citizens. These reasons, as well as the possibility of increased economic markets for agricultural products, influenced many of the Dominicans who lived in the frontier regions. The idea gained some traction among members of the military as well, and in 1821, Governor Sebastian Kindlin discovered that some of the Dominican military officers in Azua and Santo Domingo had already become planned of the unification with Haiti. A defining moment took place on November 15, 1821, when the leaders of several Dominican towns, particularly Diabon and Monte Cristi, adopted the Haitian flag. In the meantime, in Santo Domingo, under Nunez de Caceres leadership, those who viewed the Spanish crown as incapable of reviving the colonial economy declared their independence from Spain on November 30th, 1821. They removed all Spanish government officials and named themselves to the independent state of Spanish Haiti. However, as the end of 1821 approached, Bolivar failed to fulfill his commitment to Nunez de Caceres and his followers. The military and economic aid they expected never materialized. At the same time, a military envoy from President Boye arrived in Santo Domingo, bringing, them, bringing with them a message of support and an offer of political and military backup for the new government. Knowing that he would get no support from the mulatto majority in Santo Domingo, and that those from the ruling class viewed him as a traitor who had overthrown the Spanish government, he found himself forced to accept Boye's offer and conditions. Nonetheless, contrary to his friendly promises, Boye mobilized an army of 12,000 men into Santo Domingo. These Haitian forces were met with minimal resistance. Seven weeks after gaining independence from Spain, the newly founded Spanish Haiti found itself under Boye's occupation. Knowing, however, that two of the three existing factions on the eastern side of the island could offer resistance to the occupation, the Haitian president prepared himself to use military force against both the colonial elite and the pro-Colombians. The high levels of resentment and Boye's inability to improve the lives of both the Creoles and former slaves led to the development of resistance movement in different parts of the island. Of particular significance are the Trinitarios, led by men such as Juan Pablo Duarte and Ramon Mella, and the young mulatto Francisco de Rosario Sanchez. These movements, combined with opposition from both groups within Haiti and the long-lasting effects of a powerful earthquake in 1842, left Boye's government weakened. On February 27th, 1844, the Trinitarios marched on Puerta del Conde in Santo Domingo and declared Dominican independence from Haiti. To the present day, Dominicans celebrate the national independence on this date, marking the separation not from the Spanish crown, but from their neighbors to the west of the island. Now, unfortunately, the, you know, the Haitian quote unquote occupation or invasion, as they call it, which it really wasn't an invasion. I mean, we just pretty much just walked through the front door and just sat on the couch. You know what I'm saying? Niggas ain't really fire no shots or nothing like that. So it wasn't really an invasion. It was kind of like a mutual, like, you know, understanding. But honestly, due to this event, there's a lot of tension still to this day among, you know, Haitian nationalists and Dominican nationalists, whatever. But me, listen. The Dominicans try to justify the xenophobia towards Haitians by saying, you know, look at what General, look at what Jean Pierre Boye did to us, look at what Boye did to us, but they don't understand the Haitian nationalists. We don't like Boye either. You think we, yo, fuck Boye, fuck Petron, fuck them plantation babies. I don't give a fuck about them niggas. You think, bro? Listen, the Dominicans, they they hate Boye, but we but we hate Boye too. We don't like Boye either. So I don't understand, like, there's certain Dominican nationalists that, you know, they try to use Boye's actions against the entire Haitian nation, but they don't understand 
we don't we're not fans of Boye. Boye had us under subjugation as well. The Haitian population was not prospering under the rulership of Jean Pierre Boye. We were all fucked up, bro. We were all fucked up economically, bro. It wasn't like the Haitians was living high off the hog and the Dominicans were suffering and just, you know, under subjugation. No, Jean-Pierre Boyer, he was incompetent all around. It wasn't just the Dominicans that were suffering. The Haitians were not fans of the man either, bro. So, you know, I just want to say that to, you know, if there's any Dominican nationalists that's watching the video, listen, whatever beef you got because of what Jean-Pierre Boyer did, listen, we don't we don't like Jean Pierre Boye either. We don't fuck with him either. Okay, you say fuck Boye, the Haitians say fuck Boye as well. Like we don't like that motherfucker, bro. Fuck him. It, fuck him, bro. Fuck him. Like it is what it is, bro. Fuck him. But yeah, man, that's what happened after uh Christoph died. That's what happened after Christoph died. The plantation babies from the south they ended up taking over the entire uh the entire island. And obviously, it's no it comes as no surprise to anyone. They couldn't even properly govern their little tiny corner. Take a look up on the screen. The plantation babies from the south, they couldn't even control or govern their little tiny corner called the Republic of Haiti back then. So you think when they controlled the entire island from the Kingdom of Haiti to Santo Domingo, you think they were going to be able to govern the entire island when they couldn't even properly govern their little tiny corner? Bro, it, no, it comes as no surprise. It comes as no surprise that they were incompetent. They were always were incompetent. They didn't know how to govern shit. They didn't know how to govern shit, bro. It is what it is, bro. And like I said in the last video, man... Only only question we could ask is, you know, what if, what if, what if instead of the Republic taking over, what if the kingdom took over, man? Imagine how the course of history would have went in a different direction if the kingdom of Haiti ended up taking over and not the Republic of Haiti ended up taking over. The Republic of Haiti took over and we've been in the goddamn toilet ever since, bro. We've been in the goddamn dump ever since, bro. The Republic of Haiti should have never been allowed to even exist, bro. Christoph, listen, Christoph, let me talk to you, big bro. Let me talk to you, chief. Let me talk to you. I, I come in peace. I come. I come as a humble, as a humble descendant. I come as a humble descendant. Somebody who admires you. Somebody who loves you. I love you, Christoph. I love you, big bro. Listen, you should have never let General Petron. You should have never let General Boyer. You should have never let them exist, bro. You should have never let them exist. You should have called on the on the assistance of the British Navy. Surrounded the entire southern surround the entire southern border you know what i'm saying and march on them niggas bro vanquish them niggas bro you should have whacked them niggas off the face of the earth bro you are too generous bro you are too generous you are too generous you are way too generous you are too patriotic you love the people too much you still look at them as your brother as your brother in arms even though they were nothing but disloyal plantation babies you should have marched into the south and destroyed the south big bro you should have destroyed the south you should have went scorched earth on the south my nigga you should have went scorched earth bro i'm telling you bro you should have put out an edict put out a proclamation and said listen listen come join the kingdom of haiti anybody who refuses to join the kingdom of haiti if you refuse to join the kingdom of haiti if you refuse to pledge allegiance to the kingdom of haiti we are going scorched earth on you bro if you refuse to join the kingdom you will die you should have did that, bro. Join the kingdom or die. And then you should have marched in 25,000 deep, 45,000 deep. You had an army, a standing army of over 55,000 men. You should have marched in and destroyed the South, bro. Destroyed the South, man. I'm telling you, bro. Anyways, man. It's your boy Nefakari Desaline back in the building. Yes, indeed. Cash out up on the screen. And I'm gone. Peace. <laughs>